Hey, welcome to the Saturday Morning Success Talk Show, where we share with you the secrets of success in life, relationships, and business. I'm Dennis Dermella, and streaming in live from her studios in Los Angeles, California, this is Sandra D. Robinson. Welcome, Sandra. Thanks, Dennis. Thank you so much. I'm really excited. You know, I got to tell you, I get excited about doing this show now, especially when we have guests like today. So um, why don't you tell everybody who's here? I'm excited. Absolutely. Well, I'm glad you're excited because I used to have to drag you out every Saturday morning and say, I promise it's going to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> Today we have probably one you of the You did kind of trick me into being here. What's that? <laughs> <laughs> I said you did kind of trick me into being here in the beginning, but now I'm glad you did. That's good. That's good. Well, I want to try to change it so that you think that you tricked me into being here, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Today we have got a great guest. And in fact, when we put out some promos on Facebook, I mentioned that he is, he is one of the greatest uh, singers and ministers in the galaxy. Uh, this last uh, last year, he was on X Factor, and he wowed the judges. The judges were amazed, and not only because of his voice, which is angelic, is one of the words that they used, but Freddie Combs came out in a big wheelchair, and he used to weigh over 900 pounds and lost, at the time, he had lost almost 400 pounds. He has now lost almost 470, or has lost 475. I won't use the word almost in there because I want to give you credit for every single pound. But uh, we want to welcome Freddie Combs to the show. Welcome, Freddie. How are you? I'm good, Dennis. How are you doing? Oh, we are doing great. Well, we, uh, we are really hoping to get motivated by what's motivating you. We want to find out what is motivating you to, to lose weight, to be a youth minister, and to sing. It's so great to have you on the show. Thank you so much. It's, it's a great opportunity, and I am privileged, and I consider it an honor to be on the show today. Well, thank you. Hey, I want to start right off with some really big stuff. When we did our, our pre-show call the other day, we talked, you and Sandra and I were talking, and I'd like for you to start off by telling us what happened in the emergency room. If we can start off with that, if that's all right. What, what happened to you, what you were concerned about, and then what it turned into? Well, it was back in uh, June of 2009. I was rushed to the emergency room of our local hospital. Um, I was turning black and blue. I was not breathing. And I received an ambulance ride to the hospital and once I got there um, I was in and out of consciousness uh, didn't really know what was going on but uh, I was told at first when I first got there that I was praying and I was singing uh, as I was on on the gurney waiting to be uh, checked into the emergency room uh, I was praying and singing and preaching uh, and talking a little bit out of my head as well. There was a whole lot going on. Yeah. But as they checked me into the critical care unit, uh, where I spent three weeks there as they checked me into the critical care unit. Wow. So they were, they were checking you into the... Did he freeze up? Intensive care? Yes, they checked me into the critical care unit of the local hospital. And uh, upon being admitted there, um, they told me that my pulmonologist, that my lungs were in tremendous decline and they were the size of a baby's lungs. Wow. Uh, and you can imagine how, how large a human's lung, a, a grown adult's lungs are uh, to that of a baby. And not only that, a baby's lungs trying to run my big body at the time is, well, it's one of the reasons I almost that I was going to have to uh, learn how to work my lungs again and breathe. So I began to do uh, breathing exercises. But I was trained in college as a classically trained operator. I worked with diaphragm exercises in college. So I knew what I was going to have to do. I knew I was going to have to sing and exercise my diaphragm that I could live. So 
I began singing. Uh, in the hospital. I started when I first, in the hospital. I began singing, and when I first began singing, it was very labored. Uh, I, I, when I first started, I had some fear that I possibly wouldn't be able to do it again. And I kept pressing on, and I persevered, and I kept singing. And uh, I got, I immediately started receiving. Well, I, as I was singing, I was singing praises to the Lord, and uh, I was began to get concerned that I was probably going to be told to be quiet because it was in the middle of the night. I was on medication that they had me on uh, because they, they were awake. They were afraid that I was going to pass away in the middle of the night if I fell asleep. Wow. So, it, yeah. and they, um, I was, I began singing and it got louder and louder. And then I, as my strength came back, yep, I just wore it out. And uh, the one of the nurses came by and she said, um, Mr. Combs, uh, you're singing. And I said, yes, ma'am. And I was afraid she was going to tell me to be quiet. And I knew that was probably going to be an issue because I wasn't. He, he's freezing up a little bit here. Um, when we do this live show, we run into stuff like this every once in a while. But um, <laughs> he, he was sitting in the, in the hospital bed singing in the middle of the night. And the nurse came in and said uh, something about your singing, right? You there, Freddie? He's back. Yes, I'm here. You're back there again. We go. go ahead. Me moving <laughs> um, she said, you're singing, and the patient down wants to know if you would uh, not. Uh, that was not what I thought I was going to hear. I thought they would want me to be quiet. Yeah, he paused but a little fact, bit the right patient, there. Uh, what He, he kind of broke up a little bit. What the nurse said was that the patient down the hall said, would you please not stop singing? No, stop. Yes, they wanted me to continue to sing. Um, I, of course, the response I thought I was going to get was, would you please be quiet? Uh, in fact, the, uh, the patient down the hall had just been told that they had terminal cancer and they only had a few days to live. So what actually happened was the me receiving strength in my own body uh, with me singing was giving help to somebody else. Wow. And uh, I found that a great encouragement. And, of course, for the next two weeks, I sang nonstop. Uh, I got request after request after request, and I just kept singing. Wow, that's that's like probably the longest concert you that. ever did was in the hospital bed. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know that's of anybody. True. I don't know of any any artist that could say I did a concert for two weeks with the same audience and they kept sending me requests. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had I had a captive audience audience of sorts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. I uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah, we. You're good. Can you hear me? Okay, cool. I wanted, I wanted to ask from there. I mean, here you are, and you started this singing again, and and you know, you you got this great exposure from getting on to the show. But how did you get there? Who? I, I mean, was did some? Did you get yourself into this competition? Who actually got you involved in the first place? Well. I actually, uh, my wife and I did a couple of shows with TLC uh, prior to that, and with with that exposure, we were introduced to a uh, a producer uh, from Europe, and he encouraged me to. He heard me sing, and he encouraged me to that. And actually, he is the he is the reason. He was the the push behind it. He actually told me. He said, "I'm going to get you on that show." So he called me one day and he said, uh, uh, his, his name is, is Hans, and he said, uh, said, meet me in Nashville, Tennessee. And uh, I said, okay. And we went to the mall in Nashville, Tennessee, at a, at a mall there, and there was a little 
kiosk type thing there, and it's called My Studio. And I went into that, and they hosted uh, X Factor auditions. You can send your audition in through that way. And that's what I did. And I went into this little bitty cubicle that was just about the size for my wheelchair to fit in. <laughs> As a matter of fact, when I, when I, saw, when I saw the little kiosk, it, it sat free in the middle of the mall. I saw it, and I told Gay, I said, uh, I'll never be able to get in that. That looks like a sauna to me. And um, so I went in. I, I sat down and saw a little bitty uh, clip of uh, Simon Cowell giving us the instructions and uh, he said we had so many, well, actually would have been so many seconds. I think it was like a minute and a half to tell us, to tell them about ourselves and why we're the X Factor and uh, and then sing our, our selection. Well, I happened to sing Bridge Over Troubled Water, which happens to be one of my very favorite songs. And uh, I did that and, and I was done. And me and my wife enjoyed a, an afternoon in Nashville and we came home. And uh, I had not heard anything else from anyone, and I just assumed that I was not going to be on the show. I did not know whether the show had come on or they had already had a winner. I, did not, I didn't know. And then in late July, uh, one Thursday evening, I got a call from a producer at X Factor, and they said to me, you need to be in Greensboro on Sunday to audition before the judges. And this was which, which said, day of the really? week was it now? You were told to be there on Sunday? I was told on a Thursday. Wow. That I needed to be there on Sunday. Well, that's kind of tough, isn't it? it? Well, it was very challenging because I also had to have five songs in tow to sing, <laughs> ready to go. Wow. Memorized, and I had to choose, I had to choose wow. a list of songs that was on a certain website, and uh, uh, the track, it was all tracks, and you uh -huh. couldn't have any background vocals, so it was it was tough because my normal uh, repertoire, gospel music, <laughs> so I pulled from some wedding songs that I had done in the past, and um, I think I even <laughs> chose one Doobie Brothers song that I remember from <laughs> my childhood. <laughs> but I... We went and we we went to Greensboro, and uh, we got there at eight o'clock that morning. I assumed that we would be done at least by lunchtime. As a matter of fact, I had already talked to my wife and I said, "Where would you like to have lunch?" And uh, I thought we'd be out there by twelve because I thought it was sort of like yeah. you go before four judges and then you're out. So you get a, a little ticket right. and you're passed on right. to Hollywood or whatever. And uh, Little did I know, uh, I did not get on the stage that night to perform, which is actually what people saw uh, in Greensboro. That was at about 10 or 10.30 that night. Wow. Oh, my gosh. Wow. So wow. it was a long day so for me. So I, I got I to gotta ask a fun question. Who was your favorite judge? Simon was my favorite. Why? He's usually the scariest for people. I know. It. Well, you know, I, I really like people who tell it like it is. I mean, I, I like people uh, who are very upfront with you and you know where you're standing with them. You don't have to worry about what they're going to say behind your back. They'll say it to your face. I like that. And uh, the, the, uh, the encouraging thing was is everything that he said to me, I already knew he was going to say that. The night before my audition, uh, I happened to see a clip of him on uh, some entertainment magazine television show. I can't remember which one it was. And they were talking about how he is, is a man of habit and he has so many pairs of the same jeans and so many pairs or so many sure. the same kind of shirt. He's the same thing and this, that, and other thing. And uh, the Lord said to me, he is going to feel like he needs to help you. Of me standing and singing. And I told my wife, we were worn out because we had just traveled from Tennessee. We were in Greensboro in a little hotel because we just had about two nickels rubbed together, just enough to get us a, a hotel room. And uh, we were, and I told my wife, and she was like, okay. And I was like, yeah, okay, let's go to sleep because we were tired. And then when he said that the next night, I almost started laughing because I knew it was coming. And then it was a great encouragement to me. Um, it was... Uh, 
or was it nervous singing in front of all those people? I don't know why for me, but I would rather sing for a million people than to sing for one person because to me, it, I'm more nervous singing for one than I am for 5,000. Wow, wow. That, in, you a way, to us. in a way, I know oh, that... Go ahead. Oh, go ahead, Dennis. Say, Sorry, it is difficult with a delay. We're working on that. Yeah, we're, we're ahead, great. Uh, we're, we're so glad to have you on the show, Freddie. Yeah. Uh, even even with the delay and and the little breakups and stuff, it's it's like just a, a unique experience I think for us to to share, especially those who have seen your video. Which, by the way, I'm I'm going to go ahead and create a little spot and have our folks uh, create a spot where if you go to to uh, smsuccess.org/freddie, it's going to take you right to that video from X Factor so that you can watch that because you need to watch it. If you watch it, you're going to cry and say, wow, amazing. Now, you told us, Freddie, during the uh, pre-show sure. uh, talk that we had that, that you are able to walk and all that, but Freddie. not very much. Is that correct? I think we might have lost Freddie. Okay. All right. We'll bring Freddie back in then. The, the yeah. engineers will... But what, what, <clears throat> Dennis, what I, what I wanted to have him talk about, and I just thought this was great, um, I think something for him that was surprising is, in a way, the power that came that he talked about once he was recognized. You right. know, it was one incredible right. moment, and people will, if, that saw it will know. And if you were able to put up the link uh, to to his show, people will see. It was one incredible moment that was very unforgettable. And he said, starting the very next day, as soon as he went out, people would see him and. I thought this was the coolest thing, knowing that he was a minister, you know, he had given a little bit about himself. He said people would walk up to him, not only recognize him and want his picture and that kind of thing and say that he inspired them, but they would ask him to pray for them. And he said it felt like he just had this, you know, ab ability to reach more people and, and, and kind of connect with more people from that time of just being on stage and doing something that he loved doing. And I thought, what an inspirational thing for us to take, right. you know, knowing that it's easier than ever to put yourself out there in front of a lot of people and look what, you know, what one incredible moment did for, for so many. Yeah, I, I remember him talking yeah. also about, we're, we're going to bring him back, by the way, during the break that comes up in just a few minutes. But uh, Freddie did talk about that with us, and it was important that they recognized, because he mentioned that he was a minister, and because he had mentioned that, when people saw him, I think he said he and his wife went to the mall or something, and people just stopped him and said, oh, you're that guy, and would you please pray for me, you know, and would you please pray for so-and-so, and, you know, the, it, it really helped his ministry. So I think when we come back and have him back on here, that's one of the things that we got to talk about is how, how that exposure, how he was able to use that exposure for good. Uh, and I mm -hmm. have to admit, you and I, I, I know we're on tears and we'll try not to be in tears here on the show, but just listening to him share yeah. how much he enjoys being able to help people as he has was amazing. It's true. But I think it's a lesson, too, for us. Like, you know, I work with with experts and visionaries and I help them get comfortable in front of a camera and and leverage their message. And sometimes people say, well, I, you know, I don't want to step in front of the camera, even if it's to give a testimonial at, at an event or, you know, at a, at a festival or a charity, uh, you know, fundraising. They're afraid of getting in front of the camera, but sometimes just stepping in front of a camera, even if it's something that isn't related to your message about your business, you know, necessarily can bring you the type of attention that can expand and your day. And this is a very big example of that. Oh, very, very true. So we're at 30 seconds here. We're going to go to break. And when we come back, we'll have uh, Freddie Combs back on and we'll talk to him about his experiences with X Factor and with the judges there, with his ministry, with his weight loss. I mean, talk about incredible. He, he's lost, I'm a pretty big guy, and he's lost more weight than I weigh in total. So uh, we're glad to have him back on here in just a few minutes. So we'll be back right after this break. Did you know kids who play outdoors have healthier lungs? Totally. I did. Did you know that boys that play with dolls make better husbands? My son has lots of dolls. 
But did you know terry cloth diapers breathe better? I did. Mm -hmm. Totally true. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you know that strollers have the right of way on a sidewalk? Yes. Yep, I did. Did you guys did know? Did you know that kids who eat breakfast have higher GPAs? Yeah, I know. Okay. Yeah. That's actually what I was going to say. Did you know babies should never touch silver? It's really bad for them. I knew that. Did you guys know that statistically friendly kids have more friends? Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's obvious. Did you know most people think they're using the right car seat for their kid, but they're not? Parents who really know it all know for sure that their child is in the right seat at the right age and size. Visit safercar.gov slash the right seat to make sure your child is protected. I'm putting that on my blog. I just put it in mine. All right, give me a spot. You know my motto, safety first. They could be dangerous. I think we should call animal control. Animal control? To be safe. Don't worry. Just... I got this. It's a new motto. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. You're watching Eagle Vision, Mount Sassino College's very own television channel. Hey, welcome back to the Saturday Morning Success Talk Show. Hey, we've had a great opportunity right before the break. We lost Freddie. Uh, it was great, though, that we've got this technology. We can be all over the country and come together for this show for you on Verizon Fios and on Time Warner Cable. But while, uh, while Freddie was gone, you guys don't tell him. We talked about him while he was gone. But uh, he's back now. <laughs> Welcome back, Freddie. How you doing? I'm good. My ears were burning. That's good. That's good. Uh, we, were, we were making up all <laughs> kinds of stories about you, so now you're going to have to, uh, <laughs> to tell, the, tell the viewers the truth now. But uh, actually, Sandra and I were talking about the experience that you shared with us uh, after the show had aired and you and your wife went to the mall and how it touched and, and helped your ministry, too. Can you share a little bit about that experience with our viewers? The day that the show aired, my wife and I had planned to um, watch the show uh, by ourselves and just enjoy a quiet evening. Uh, that was not to be, uh, lots of, there was entertainment tonight was there and they filmed us watching the show. And, uh, the very next day I woke up and my face, uh, was everywhere on paper, newspapers and TV and internet, and, uh, which was weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that, that evening we went to, uh, the local mall, uh, just to get out and go have some fun. And, uh, and we had not even, well, I had gotten out of the car and gotten in my wheelchair and we were, oh, and somebody said, wait a minute, aren't you that guy that was on TV last night on X Factor? <laughs> wow. And I thought to myself, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, probably within 30 minutes of us being in the mall that evening, um, what, what we have come to refer to as a sighting. <laughs> a sighting. Uh, you know, I'm imagining probably, yeah, as you're sorry. telling this story that you're on the roller coaster and it's going, and you know it's getting ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. We had already probably been sighted about 10 times. And I've told my wife, I said, maybe I should wear a hat and sunglasses. And she said, no, I don't think that's going to get it. <laughs> <laughs> that's funny. But, the good thing is uh, I've had lots of opportunity uh, to meet a lot of people. And with the fact that they had announced on X Factor that I was a minister, a lot of people come up to me and they say, will you pray for me? 
that and the other thing. I remember one of the very first people we met was a, a girl but to me and she said, um, I have cancer. And she said, I've just got out of the hospital. Will you please pray for me? And uh, It's got to feel good to be able to do something to help other people out. So we, we, we had him freeze up a little bit there, but he met a girl that, uh, that had cancer that uh, asked for him to pray for her. And uh, did, we, did we lose him? Okay, we're going to call him yeah, back. Yeah, we're having some trouble with that. Yeah, we are a little bit. Connection. That, that makes it a little <laughs> bit more fun. So we, go ahead and try to call him back while we're on the air. It That's fine. Us. We'll make it happen. That's the fun of trying to do a live show. And you know, Dennis, it keeps us on our toes. It does. It does. I'm, I'm really glad when these technical things happen because, <laughs> you know, it's, we do teach a lot about success. And, and part of success is being able to overcome hurdles like these. And... <laughs> And this morning on my radio show, uh, Michael Stevenson, the NLP expert, was saying that we have to change the word uh, to challenges and opportunities. So, hey, we're glad we got you back on here, Freddie. And Freddie, we, uh, where we lost you was you told us that you met a girl that said she had cancer and wanted you to pray for her. So can you continue from there? I think we got him frozen. Boy, we're having a good day today. There you go. There he is. I see him. We, uh, I met the lady, and she said she had cancer and asked us to pray for her. And I'm the type of individual who, when somebody says, will you pray for me, I pray right then. So we prayed with her right in front of them all. And uh, as a matter of fact, it, uh, other people started coming up and said, who are you? Because uh, they kept hearing that we had been on TV. And... Uh, and it, 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 we're losing them good. For hope. There we go. We are thankful that the Lord has used it to open a door for us to minister for Him. Well, and that's that's what you hold. Can I um? Go go ahead. Cool. I, I just wanted to make sure that um, I know we're having some technical difficulties there with Freddie, so I hope you can hear me as I'm, as I'm talking. But um, I wanted to make sure, too, that we got to another part of your story, Fred Inspirational. Um, the, the, the very that you have lost so much weight. I want to just acknowledge that, that while the numbers are extraordinary, your ability to stay maintained and focused on that goal is incredible. I mean, we're living, I mean, just looking at the United States alone, obesity is becoming a, an epidemic, it seems, worldwide. And a lot of folks blame us Americans for bringing in McDonald's to all the other countries. But, um, sorry, nothing against McDonald's. Please don't call us or write us or sue us for that. But just, you know, that our... Our, our love of fast food as Americans, um, as we're spreading our, you know, our wonderful eateries to these other locations, people are blaming us. But the reality is in the United States, two thirds, two thirds of adults are considered overweight or obese. And the children, unfortunately, this is the saddest thing for me, 25% of children are now considered obese, which kind of sets up, um, I, I think, a tough life as far as their health is concerned. So looking at what you've done, what would your biggest motivation uh, that you could share? I mean, what is your, how, what's the thing, what's the word I'm looking for? Your biggest piece of advice for somebody that is thinking that they can't make that first step or that they can't reach their goal. What would you say to them? Uh, the first piece of advice I would offer to someone who is dealing with weight issues would be to please get knowledge uh, because, uh, I almost lost my life because I did not have knowledge of what to eat. I was eating very little. I was <coughs> eating like a rabbit. Uh, I was eating uh, lettuce and carrots and cucumbers, and which all that stuff is good, and I love it. I mean, I, but you have to have protein, and I did not know that. Um, I was, I've always been told all of my life, because I've always been big, push away from the table. You've got to have the want to be thin, and I could go on and on. But uh, I was supposed to have protein, 
And the reason, one of the reasons I landed in the hospital was because I was protein deficient. I was anemic. I was eating ice like crazy. Uh, for the last, for seven months prior to me being hospitalized, I would eat ice like it was like the best. I think it would be a filet mignon. I'm just eating like crazy. Well, that happens to be a sign of being anemic. Huh. And I was anemic. My, as a matter of fact, my nutritionist, when I was in the hospital, she came into my room when I was in critical care and she said, she pulled the door and she said, okay, what I need you to understand is I'm the only one that believes you in this hospital that's when you say you've not been eating because you're all of your, all of your work, blood work and everything says that you are anemic. You've not been eating. Uh, you are malnutritioned. And I said, well, thank God somebody finally believes me because everybody assumes because I'm big as a whale, I was taking in the amount of food that a whale would eat, which wasn't the case. But back to the, back to the, to what I would offer would be get knowledge and understand that, uh, I always, people ask me a lot about what I should, what they should do for a diet. And there is a, and I would encourage you to contact me. I would be glad to help, help anybody. I would send them a little email that I usually send out. But there is a, a thing on the, on the internet that you can do a calorie, uh, counter or a calorie intake as far as your weight is concerned. And it will tell you how much, uh, how many calories you can eat a day for you to lose weight because you have to eat a specific amount to lose weight. That's, it's good for people to have that knowledge. A lot of knowledge. people don't know that. A lot of people don't know that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Yeah, go ahead, Sandra. Oh, sorry. No, I'm just saying a lot of people don't realize that you actually have to eat. You know, the, the thing now they're saying is eat breakfast and you'll be thinner. And people are starting to kind of get the little seeds planted in their head that that's really what they should be doing. Right. Um, listening to you, hopefully we can reach a few more folks that they can understand that. And also, your would you share your motivation? And this is the part that I know can get a little emotional for you and for us, I think, too, when we hear the story. But I said your big why really isn't so much for yourself. It's for someone else. Can you share that with us? That is very true. My lovely wife for 17 years. And I've been married to my wife for 17 years. And uh, she is the love of my life. I can't even remember a time when I did not have her in my life. As a matter of fact, uh, when I think about my life, I assume that she knows exactly what I'm talking about when I talk about things from my past. And uh, she began taking care of me as my caregiver about a month into our marriage. Mm. And when I say caregiver, the best way I can explain it would be like, I would be, I am her big baby who is, uh, can, can talk intelligibly. It's not like I have to have a pacifier in my mouth, <laughs> but she has to help me. She takes care of me. Uh, she does, she does a lot of things for me. Now, as I have gotten, as I've gotten more healthy, I've been able to take over some of my own freedoms back. But the, uh, the motivator for me is for her. Uh, because I want to give her everything that she has missed out for 17 years. Uh, there have been things that we've not gotten to do because I've not been able to do them. Uh, it's, I have a prison, and because she loves me and because I love her, she has remained locked in there with me. And uh, I don't know a whole lot of women who would do the same thing for their own husbands. And... Uh, that's that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, I want to, like, for instance, um, I can't stand it that she has to get out and pump gas for us because, to me, that's what I should be doing. Mm. Or be taking out the trash and those type of things. And um, it, it dawned on me, you know, I almost died in 2009. I was fine to to die. I'm, I'm comfortable with dying because I know where I will be. I'll be with the Lord Jesus. But I was my heart ached for my wife because I knew that she me. But I didn't want to. Come. 
we're losing Freddie again in a little bit, but uh, his his love for his wife has definitely yeah. been a big motivator for him, for him. And uh, when he gets uh, going here would again, it, I want to ask I him, uh, his advice for for spouses of people who are having difficulties like this. So we've lost him. We are getting ready to go to to break in a few minutes here, but uh, we'll bring him back. Mm -hmm. Did you did would you I, have a thought? What I loved. Yeah, I was saying what I loved about uh, about him telling the story is that, you know, chivalry, the the, the chival, the sh you know that that sense inside of him of just wanting to take on, as he described to to me off the era, um, that role that he sees it traditionally for men and traditionally for women, and not in a submissive kind of you know, a, a, you know, anti-feminism kind of way, but rather like he said that he wants to be the the one to open doors to pump the gas and right. and when she had to you know mow the lawn at one point he said it was really hard for him to see that and that became his real motivation on a daily note from him if we can get him back um and i'm sure we will is to find out if he actually has had those days that we all do when we're when we're on a you know a, you want to say a diet but really for him it has to be a lifestyle change that's why i love the fact that he said um his his advice was not knowledge. Didn't she just love that, Dennis? I thought that was the best yeah. piece of diet advice that I've heard. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Knowing what you need to do, and in fact, I um, I think that he and I were talking on on the radio show uh, last week. Uh, he was my guest there on my other show, and he he and I were talking about the importance of two main things. One is is knowledge. And the other is a mentor or, or somebody to support you. So I think if you mix those two things, those are the, the ingredients to really make it work. So um, if, if you have a thought on that, why don't you go ahead and, and share your feeling of having a mentor to help you in your life. And I'm going to see if maybe we can go to break here just a little bit early and get him back on here. So what is your thought about having well, a mentor? I, I think... Yeah, what actually, um, I totally agree with that in, in every aspect of your life. I think mentor, coach, cheerleader, um, and, and, you know, and knowledge, which can come from any, any of the above. A mentor or coach can give you knowledge. You can find knowledge yourself, of course, but, uh, I think all of things, whether it's fitness or look at the three areas of our show here is success, relationships, and life. Yeah. Uh, I think all of those, you should have a mentor, you should have someone that you look up to. And, you know, Dennis, you've lost so much weight since we're on the fitness um, and weight loss idea. Do you have, I, you have somebody that's kind of kicking your booty to get in that gym, don't you? I, I do. My my personal trainer is uh, is Paul David. And he and I have a private web page that I, I actually haven't been that good the last couple of weeks. So the fact I'm saying this on air is going to recommit me but I take a picture of everything that I eat and share it with him on that Facebook page and he can tell me good job or better, uh, better luck next time. <laughs> so okay, I, it helps so a I lot. I guess you're the only one that I can say, you're the only one that I can say I wouldn't mind posting uh, the pictures of your food. Cause that's the joke. When people say people right. post too much, they're posting pictures of their breakfast, lunch and dinner. <laughs> you actually are allowed to do that. I am allowed to do it. That's right. Just with him. So, well, we're, we're going to go to break here yes. and, uh, and get Freddie back on and, uh, and we'll get going from there. So we'll be back right after this. Well, you're wrong. I'm wrong. You're the one who misrepresented that. No right to call You are the worst example of politics. I stand for something. Flip flop. I stand for something. Flip flop or flip flop. Your proposal is ludicrous. My proposal will go exactly the way I say it will. My dead body. I think somebody needs a timeout. That's the power of one. I motion that I be issued the timeout. And wow. Me too. Yeah, for sure. You should get a time out. I apologize. And I motion that we, uh, I, start showing more respect. 
civility. Pass it on. Okay, people, listen up. Our fugitive has been on the run for 90 minutes. Average foot speed over uneven terrain, barring any injuries, is four miles per hour. That's a six mile radius. I want checkpoints established at I-95, 495, and over at Route 66. What I need from each and every one of you is a full target search of every gas station, residence, warehouse, farmhouse, hen house, outhouse, and dog house in that area. Your fugitive has just cashed in his 401k plan, and all he had to do was roll it over. Go get him! Learn about rollovers in protecting your financial future, and choose to save. You can't mess with a big dog. Come on back in. We're glad to have you back on the Saturday Morning Success Talk Show with our guest, Freddie Holmes, the best singer in the world, the, probably lost the most weight in the world, and one of the best youth ministers in the world. So we are glad that you've combined all these successes in your life and that we're able to share them with you today. So Sandra and I have enjoyed having you on the air. No worries that we've had a little technical difficulty because we, we succeed through challenges. Is that correct? So correct. <laughs> we definitely do. Hey, I, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna pull a uh, pull a rug out from everybody here and ask: Is your wife Kay right around there by any chance? She sure is. I knew that you were gonna do that. Yeah, have Kay. her stick her head in there. We we want to we want a quick hello Come from down. Kay if you don't mind, Kay. She doesn't mind at all. Just have her stick her head in there and, and maybe she can give some advice funny. to other spouses of, out there of someone who, uh, asking you to get the there we go, we'll get her to, to hear what's going on. Hi, Kay. How you doing, Kay? How are you doing? Good. Doing wonderful. Hey, we know uh, he keeps telling us that you are the part of the secret to his success. So we wanted to have you on here really quick. And can you give us some advice for the spouse of someone who's trying to reach some kind of a goal, whether it be weight loss or start a new business or something that's a challenge. What do you think has inspired you to help inspire him? Well, I would definitely say that love is the driving factor. When I said I do 17 years ago, I meant I do in the good times and the bad times. No matter what, I really meant it. I knew there would be ups and downs. But my suggestion is love and just stick to it. Love and stick to it. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it, Kay. That's, uh, he's, he's been an inspira you've been an inspiration to him, and he's shared that with us. So it's nice to get it straight from your mouth. Uh, love and stick with it. So we thank you very yes. much. I appreciate it. Thank you it. so much. Beautiful. What an angel. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. You know, to put up with somebody like Freddie. Oh, wait a minute. Can he hear us? <laughs> <laughs> I heard that one. Uh-oh. <laughs> of all hey, the times to not have Freddie technical difficulty. Is Freddie going to play with us on our next segment? <laughs> what, what's that, Sandra? I said, is Freddie going to play with us on our next segment? I, I'm telling you, I, I hope so. Yeah, we've got uh, we've got some great stories right now as we have have come back from break here. We uh, we have a little segment that we do called the Really News, because it's news that's not out in the main <laughs> media that Sandra, of all people, Sandra is able to find. And uh, so, Sandra, why don't you tell us some of the stories that you found for us today? All right. Now, just for fun, I look up and I see the kind of stuff that most people probably have missed in the news. So um, here we have one. And we've got a couple of, uh, shall we say, country stories today. Country. First off, we have Sheriff's Lieutenant reprimanded for firing gun to stop pooping turkey. <laughs> you know, I always got to throw one in. 
<laughs> did he, did he fire it at the turkey? Fired, <laughs> well, I, I think he did. He did refrain a little bit, but the idea behind this, I guess, was he fired his gun to stop a turkey from, and they actually wrote pooping. <laughs> that to stop the turkey from being on a police car, and now he's the one ankle deep in doo doo. They literally wrote that as the first line of this particular story. But um, Lieutenant Andy Jackson, who is a sheriff in Maury County, Tennessee, found out the hard way that shooting a gun to scare a turkey is not proper police procedure. Like somebody actually had to tell him this. Um, he's, he said, this was his, this is what he said to the news. He said, I felt it was very safe. I fired in the direction towards the woods. <laughs> okay. Fine. Oh my goodness. <laughs> his chef, his uh, a chief deputy said that he was reprimanded and that um, the, for the simple reason that we don't train our, our people to use firearms to scare animals off vehicles. So that should make us all so much safer, feel so much safer when we're traveling through Tennessee. I just thought I would go ahead and share that with you. Yeah, he, and um, he, apparently he was trying real was hard. He decided to go out on a wing on that. <laughs> I you know, I, I just find it a little bit disturbing that, we you know, we sit here, we talk about gun violence, and here's a guy that thinks nothing about shooting into the woods in an area where people hunt. It just has me going, what? Really? Oh, that's okay. funny. So the next one, right? So here's the next one. Um, I don't know how many folks out there watch reality shows like Big Brother. I have to admit, I, I watch very few. I don't watch Big Brother, but it's kind of hard to miss this particular woman, girl, whatever you want to call her, young lady, definitely maybe isn't the right word, but um, her name is Erin Grease, and she is kind of referred to as the pretty blonde that's the racist on the show Big Brother. So her excuse is, I'm not racist, I'm just Texan. She has Ooh. been thrown off the show, and, um, and you know, with many apologies to any Texans out there, I don't think this is um, at all truthful in what she is saying but i just find it an interesting an interesting interretation of um texan no i, she I think says, she, she uh, should have been talking about her her state of insanity not her state of residence i agree and i, I the saddest thing to me is that she doesn't acknowledge that this is a definition of racism. She mocked Asians. Uh, literally, I think she used the phrase, uh, she, she talked to an Asian girl that was on the show and said, just shut up and go make rice. Whoa. She said about a black man that was there, um, mate, don't go, don't close your eyes in the dark or, you know, be careful in the dark because you may not see him coming. Wow. Uh, and then she referred to a homosexual that was in the, sh in the show with them as being a queer. And when she was addressed with this, she says, well, I, I just think that that's something that we say in Texas. Sometimes we joke and we just don't mean it. I feel bad. It is now being how it's being seen and how I've come across to people. I don't want to seem like that person. Wow. So there wasn't even an apology yep. for what she did. Justification. So, um, wow, yeah, really? Yeah. And, and it says... I know. Isn't it incredible? It's it's very sad to me. And uh, what the good thing about it, I think the good media coverage here is that when she was kicked to the show, she literally now has all of this exposure. And not that I want her to be glorified, because I don't think that she is being glorified by this at all. And in a way, I think it's going to be a very harsh reality for her. But I think she deserves it. That's my opinion. Um, and I do think that it might just wake some people up as to, as we were talking before about knowledge. Yeah. She honestly did not think that that was racism. I think we have to understand what is racism very simply and understand if our behavior really is, you know, um, on the up and up. She actually thought that it was. I truly think that she thought that what she was saying was okay. Wow. So that was a scary thing, and hopefully we can educate some folks that might be looking to check themselves and what they're saying when they're out in public. Yeah, she, it sounds like she grew uh, up in the woods. Too bad that that uh, guy that tried to scare the turkey didn't uh, nail her. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? Exactly, exactly. So, um, and then we've got, we've actually got one quick one here I wanted to say, just a comment. Um, this actually came from the UK. There is a town there. Um, in the area of Kent that has actually decorated their town with Christmas lights already. 
Really? 121 days before Christmas. Now, is it just us? I know that every year we hear this, we complain about the fact that you walk into the stores before Halloween, right? It seems around Halloween time you start to see the Christmas trees. I actually walked into a store the other day and saw Christmas decorations. It was Costco, and they've already, they're not decorating the store, but they have everything for sale already, which, but they have it decor, you know, shown. So they have Christmas trees up and everything. And I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. Here we are, an entire town is decorating 121 days before the actual holiday. There, there is a reason for it though, and to justify what they're doing. They say that last year they had actually um, had a lot of their lights, their town lights were stolen. So they're doing this in order to raise funds so that they can continue to decorate and the town can celebrate. So they have um, intentionally done this. But I wonder, is it just me or does it seem like we are all decorating for Christmas incredibly sooner as far as commercial oh, areas no. like stores and things? I think, I think that people are putting lights up early or really strung out. That's my thought. <laughs> So, All right, and then we have one. We have one hot topic that I want to throw out there. While, while um, you're reading speaking, your hot topic, we're going to bring Freddie back in too because we lost him. So you oh, can good. keep talking, but we're going to change this, bring him back in too. Yeah. No, I want him to comment on some of these things if we can get him back. Okay. Now you may have noticed that. Um, speaking of of reality shows. Uh, I have some some friends staying with me right now, and and I have to admit they they watch the Kardashians, and I found myself being a little bit sucked in to all of the drama, and you know the youngest Kardashian I believe is is Kylie, and you may have heard that she got into an automobile accident, and they're causing a big stink about the fact that she's now been seen driving another giant Mercedes SUV when she just had her accident after getting her license 18 days ago. Wow. Is there a part of you that feels a little sad for the? I mean, think about this. She's a teenager. She just got her license. Did you wreck a car when you were 16? I think we all wrecked a car when we first got our license, right? Or is it just me? Just me? No, no, I did not wreck. Well, never mind. <laughs> I might have. Come on. <laughs> Truth, come on. It's bringing back some interesting memories. <laughs> I can't but, tell that story. I mean, truly? I might have oh, been. Oh, yes, you can. Now, now I, you have to. I might have accidentally been driving backwards in circles in some parking lot and hit a fire hydrant, but. I wouldn't, I wouldn't. Oh, okay, see? Po that's a possibility. See? No, the only, the only <laughs> difference between you and Kylie Jenner is that she, unfortunately, is in the media and has cameras all over her at all times. That's it. Can that's you imagine? True. Imagine that's, growing up like that? I only had a mother that was all over me all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so we're bringing Freddie back up here for the last Perfect part of the show timing. here. We got Freddie back. We uh, will be coming back on, and we'll we'll finalize the show here with uh, with the last few minutes here. Hi, Freddie. Hey, we're glad to have you back, my friend. Be back. <laughs> Good. Well, we love talking behind your back, so we keep calling it technical <laughs> errors, but we just keep dropping you because we want to talk about you when you're not here. <laughs> So we, we've got a good six minutes here left on the show, and we really want to feel from your heart a little bit about the fact that, you know, there's people that are going to be watching this, you know, they're going to watch it while it's being aired, and it's going to be archived later. So what, what is the message from your heart for these people who have some kind of a, a huge challenge that they need to overcome? Well, speaking specifically to a challenge like my own, um, I would encourage uh, everyone listening to realize that, uh, and I'll put this in, in a common, uh, a common vernacular, which that's for sort of redundant, but uh, is fat people are fat people too. Uh, <laughs> just because someone is different on the outside, with whether it be handicaps or uh, any kind of physical limitation, uh, each individual has hopes and dreams. Um, I'll say that again, uh, but every, every individual has hopes and fears, dreams and talents, and they're worth knowing. Uh, the world needs to hear those. And for someone's physical limitations to stand in the way, 
people understanding who someone is, um, that could be encourage anyone who is facing um, unforgiving or uh, difficult circumstances. Realize that you can defeat what you're facing. Uh, nothing is impossible. Uh, my, my one of my uh, favorite uh, scriptures and, and thoughts is with God anything is possible and I, I keep that as a uh, a uh, pillar in my own life because I know I can make it uh, and anyone else can too I tell people all over some parts of the world in uh, emails and messages that I know that you continue to speak with people today. Oh, here, you're back on here. We lost that last tail end there, what you were talking about. You said in emails and, and in person, you always are telling people something. I always want people to know that uh, in texts and emails that I get across America and some parts of the world, that no matter what they're facing uh, with Jesus Christ, they can do anything. Yeah. And well, he, he, is, he, he is my source and he's my hope. He's a great mentor to have. And in that, and the support of your the wife best. has been great, yeah. T tell us about, I, I'm going to kind of throw it into to a little bit of fun here, too, is I'm sure that you and your wife have had some, some fun getting over challenges, too. So I'm going to put you on the spot, and, and can you think about a time that something happened that all you could do was laugh about it to get over it? Oh my goodness! I can think of enough. I can think of enough things to uh, keep us here for the next couple of weeks. Okay. <laughs> be talking end on end. Uh, to name one specific thing, I, it, it's hard. Perhaps with the uh, with the ability of you now to be out in public and be recognized, was does that bring back any memory maybe of? Uh, uh, of a time when you were trying to just be alone or something and somebody came up to talk to you, it kind of threw you off? Or, Well, I, I know uh, we were in uh, a restaurant the other day and uh, we always try to go to a restaurant anymore. We try to go like at the very end of the day <laughs> just to have some alone time. Uh -huh. <laughs> I'm sure you're recognized a lot. We are. And people usually try to pull up a chair. And I understand it. I get it. And my wife says sometimes, she goes, will we ever get to eat in peace? <laughs> at home, maybe. We might get to eat in peace at home. Yeah. Yeah, if you, if you lock the door, then... Uh... Then you'll get peace. So we lost Freddie again. Uh, we're going to finish up the show here, you and I, Sandra. Uh, we're so I'm so glad we had this time to to get together with Freddie and, and share some of his successes and, and challenges. Uh, I remember yeah. him. Uh, one of the stories that he told uh, about a lady that was in a a wheelchair that was almost like a cot, and she could hardly do anything. But when he was singing. He watched her smile, and he knew that he was mm -hmm. touching her heart. And this was somebody who everybody else might have just left alone but and thought they were worth nothing, but he could see the worth in that person. So we're going we're gonna to head on out of here now, and uh, I loved having everybody on the show. And remember, if you're thinking about becoming successful, then do the one thing, the tip that we give you every single week, and that is quit thinking about it and start doing something about it. I want to know by next week that you've done at least one more thing to get you closer to your goal. See you next Saturday.